Hi, how's everyone doing? <laughs> Woo! All right, awesome. Um, thanks so much, Casper. I'm so delighted to be here. Uh, IDFA is one of my favorite festivals. Um, so as a way to kind of introduce the type of work we do and some of the questions that have been asked to us recently, I'm going to show you uh, trailers of the last three years of our projects and like very short order snippets. So here we go. Oh, maybe we, there we don't go. We never speak of her. I picture her between us, right before it hit. Sometimes she looks back at me. Then nothing. A wet red pane, a spade, slicing like a knife, a hand, reaching. Hello, and welcome to Activitude. You will enter the constructed realities of AI clients. Simply put on and remove different virtual labor access points to jump into realities. Importance of beauty, but given how short your life There are things to do. Humans do it best. Patterns, desires, decisions, that chosen at whim. especially satisfying. Want to try another headset? Let's do another one. How about another headset? How about another headset? For sake of time, I'm going to jump, jump ahead. Um, so my name's Samantha Gorman. I'm one of the co-founders of Tender Claws. We're an art and uh, technology studio based in LA. And some of the questions that have come up to us recently that I thought might be relevant for this audience is kind of how do we create? Um, particularly, people want to know about our blending of creative writing story and narrative with interaction and form and design. Um, so a lot of it starts with me and my partner. Um, we've been working together for 13 years. Um, and to tell you a little bit about how these uh, disciplines collide, so his background is in painting and animation, but he studied conceptual art and motion graphics um, before going on to become actually interactive uh, head of different agencies for like uh, projects for Google and Kanye West. So he lived in this very weird agency world, but then he dropped out to study conceptual art. Um, and for me, um, it's actually what the field David was talking about was the field that I was essentially raised in, which is a, digi a hybrid of uh, digital writing and digital literature. 
Um, so I was in one of the first programs that married creative writing and digital literature in the US when I was 18. That was 15 years ago. Um, there were two students, and I stayed there all throughout undergrad, and then I did a master's, uh, where I was only the only student studying the merge of creative writing and technology. So it was a very surreal time. Um, but the reason that this is relevant is because while we were there and studying, um, the, the school and the kind of area we were in is very known for thinking about like postmodern art and conceptual art and formalism. And a lot of the things that you see actually revealed in our project today. Um, and I can talk more about that in a second. Um, I'm also currently finishing a PhD at U USC's Media Art and Practice. And um, when we want to learn something to do a project, uh, we just kind of learn the technology we need to do it. So that was us, and this is our cat. Um, this is us now, and this is our cat now. She just got a lion cut. And then um, now we are about 10 people, and all of these changes happened very shortly over the last three years. So it's been a, been a crazy um, ride. Um, so, there's been some interesting ingredients and inspirational contexts that are kind of the foundation for our work and our process of making. First off, I was a professor for two years. I taught digital writing and performance. And in that, my kind of history and study is on the, the kind of the roots of what is this movement in um, interactive storytelling. And it's actually been around for a really long time. Um, there's a very rich history with uh, language as a type of material, as a type of code, this idea of semantics. Um, but it's some, something that has been said earlier that bears repeating is that code always actually encodes what we do and experience culturally. It isn't just raw material. There is always intention in the algorithms. And as a poet, you kind of learn how to, you know, work with what is the raw material that you're like building and what is the intention and to really think critically about the, the writing that goes into it. Um, so one of my projects currently is to, I'm interested in how we consume cultural objects and to activate ideas for critical thinking by the working in the game field. So I'm looking at the medium of games as a lovely expressive medium to create these projects that have kind of a, um, an open-ended bend to them that like fosters discussion about some of the critical um, ask, like things in the zeitgeist today, such as AI, which is sort of um, what Tendar is about. Where some of the inspirations is we're really interested in the form um, of all our projects have a kind of tactility. So I'm going to show Pry in just a second, but this comes from the Olipo, which. Um, if you guys talking about recipes here, you guys should kind of look it up. Um, they were. In 1960s, they were writers that imagined like cons a really intense writing constraints through self-imposed algorithms. Um, and there's sort of a pro this is a, a codex, but there's a programmatic codex where you can switch through the different tabs, and each of these are stanzas that are interchangeable. Um, we're also these are reviews from a project by John Cayley, who's a poet who has political interventions into the, um, I guess, field of uh, technology today. So this is reviews in his response to his Alexa project, The Listeners, which is a poetic project which comments on Alexa always listening. Um, in terms of form, uh, this is one of the most, uh, Janine Antony, who's an artist that we really appreciate, who works a lot with the materiality of the medium. And this is Lick and Lather, where she made her mold directly from her body, then cast it several times and essentially like ate, ate herself out of it. Um, and it's really kind of sculpting with the technology and the media that you have before you. So our kind of projects are um, things that's most important to us is a marriage of form and content. So as a player, why are you doing the interaction you're doing and how does it inform or enhance the story beyond simply navigating it? Is it resonating with the audience? Is it satisfying? How are these questions changed or supported within the medium? Is it comparable to a story you, story you want to tell? Um, and we're going to very quickly talk about Pry, uh, which is going under the sort of our engagement with postmodern, uh, this uh, idea of postmodern art, where the structure is rhizomatic, it's nonlinear, there's collage and pastiche and a use of language that's sometimes inspired by Derrida, uh, Derrida or deconstruction. Um, 
And then metamodern art, which is coming out of the complete cynicism, but yet uh, a focus on a deconstruction of the past into where we are now. Um, and I found metamodern art used to describe a lot of these cultural objects we're currently producing as a useful term, because it's a more genuine sentiment. It's genuinely looked at our, our lived condition. So we're both cautiously optimistic and interested in the advancement of tech, but we're also a critic of our own naive belief. And a VR, VVR is a project that is very much about that. There's a sort of like love for the promise of VR, but a, a, um, a careful criticism of its uh, hyperbole. So media specificity, uh, these are some of the uh, guiding principles that operate in our work. Um, director versus player agency. And I think since it's a long day, I'm gonna skip ahead into showing, I've been kind of like, you know, speeding through, cause I'm gonna skip ahead to just showing the work and showing specific examples for the work to illustrate what I'm talking about. Um, so looking at, I studied the codex and thinking about creative writing in book form by actually looking at old manuscripts that were produced um, way back in the day. This is a book of Kells, which was produced by scribes. And I studied, this is kind of an early hypertext with form and image and a, uh, kind of a media work that blended different elements. Uh, so when I wanted to investigate the, how the book essentially was evolving, and this is in my uh, undergrad thesis, this is like 10 years ago now, or more in Flash. It was a marriage between looking at the book and looking at media go and story going from um, Gutenberg, going from the manuscript to Gutenberg to the internet today, mixed with various elements of travel narrative married into it. Um, so it's both past and present, it's leaping across different times, going across different links. And I wrote it when I was like 18 or 20, so you know, don't, don't fault me on that. Um, it's like showing someone your live journal. Uh, so, this is very interesting because at, at that point we were thinking about the page turn and what is the relevance to the page turn for media as like skeuomorphic design. So we built the page turn into our project, but in Pry you'll see is we wanted to go against that and think about what it meant to just publish in, um, the, just publish in a digital form. So I actually worked in a VR studio for eight years when I was doing this writing work and um, <laughs> I study immersive media and my PhD is, I'm really in, glad they talked about motivation earlier because my PhD is actually looking at how the prim principle of storytelling um, going from all the way from the panoramas of the Roman villa to immersive media now and how it's been used for hearts and minds um, and kind of what that means for like brands and what that means for us and how it could cause critical distance from these cultural objects we're looking at. So this is a cave, um, and like any of these topics, I could are their own conversations. But what was happening at that point in this media was people were just pointing and clicking and using this sort of spatial hypertext. But I was like, no, this is actually alive in a performative space. We should think about how to, what does it actually mean to create for this media? Um, so I collaborated with a dancer and choreographer, and some of that was like choreographed, some of it was improv, some of it was live generated by the computer, so it always slipped her glimpse and only the observer could read it. I'll skip over this, but it was essentially a, a play that I wrote that had a computer generate the stage instructions live on screen as actors performed it. Um, I'm still very interested in that. Um, some of this work, we created a sport uh, that actually is like, a, I included this for Casper that's played a lot in LA. And then we created a fake history of the sport as if it was played with Leaf Bellows in Utah. Um, you, some of these projects are on my website, so you can see, you can see them and there's more. And then uh, these are some of the smaller, weirder ones. Uh, this is George in the Tub, which we did in collaboration with uh, Borsch, um, and it's essentially a recreation of George Bush's self-portraits in VR, where you are in an IK George Bush body um, <laughs> painting yourself, and it's a sort of, uh, there's a lot of, we wanted to kind of leave it just at that to foster discussion about what it meant to create this project. Um, but there, you know, all that happens is Laura Bush yells at you, the dog Barney scratches, um, you see your dog George Bush face in the mirror. So this is uh, one of the places to find me, besides on my personal website, where there's a lot of these other works with write-ups about explain what they are. So I'm going to quickly switch to Pry, just so I can give you a quick taste of it before we do some live tender.
So Pride was an exercise, and there's so much to say about it. It's been three years now, um, and a lot of people have written about it and talked about it as kind of a postmodern novel. And when we wrote it, we wanted to challenge the perception of what is the book. Um, and it was, uh, in the end, it ended up being um, pulled by Apple as one of their t top apps and put into both books, games, and movies. Um, and people, you know, were wondering, like, what is the kind of semantics of what those things mean? And this was a project where we wanted to answer it. But there's a lot of different elements of multi multimodal reading where we want to marry, like, the form and the content. What does it mean when you actually read for a touchscreen media or use touchscreen media? Um, it's about a, a character that's losing his memory over time. There's um, elements of PTSD. There's uh, uh, time periods that come and go. It's very fragmented. He's also losing there sight. There were twins in her womb. So um, one of the things you get is a Braille Bible, and the ways that he's communicating is that you are in his, essentially reading a privileged guest in his mind, reading the reflections and the textures of his world. Um, and as he's reading the Bible to himself, depending on the speed... There were indeed twins in instance, her womb. For instance, you get either his contemporary memories... Um, there were indeed, indeed twins... Yeah. Her womb. Or his memories of his family and distant past in that crossover. The central conceit Wait. on Pry was one of the, um, the main chapters is this idea that you can, if you, we want you to do an interaction, we want you to be able to do it at any moment and any time. So it's not really branching narrative, but it's something that we feel that we can give to the player or the, the reader as um, feeling really present in the world and engaged and the opportunity to interact. So a lot of the novel you read by um, prying to like literally being a, a voyeur or a guest to open the eyes of the character and you see his external world in video, but then it collapses onto um, impressions of his thoughts and memories. And then even further down, you can go into a sort of subspace that's another layer. And all these layers trigger in different intricate ways that are back programmed, depending on how we want to uh, guide the reader through as directors. Um, and the last example from this is kind of an illustration of what I wanted to talk about and show in terms of like director or player agency, where we're writing a story, we're authors, we're directors. But at the same time, um, and this chapter for context, you can just pull apart these it was a pain to write, but you can pull apart these uh, texts and you get more and more um, deeper into details of the story and they all kind of wrap and fit together. But one, things you don't know that we do under the surface is um, kind of guide the reader in simple ways. So if your pinch is large, we're going to open the text to elements where you get a lot of the main um, meat of the story beats to kind of hit those story beats. But if your pinch is small, we let you kind of surgically precisely move between the lines. Um, and this is one way that we ensure as artists that you're still getting a sculpture or a, a, a structure of a narrative while giving you the freedom to explore and to move within that narrative and fill in the details. So we do that a lot of our, in our work in like these small design ways kind of behind the scenes. Um, okay, so in this like, quick flash tour through the world. Uh, I think we're gonna quickly look at Tendar. Yeah. So Tendar is a project that we just released um, on Android for free. Uh, we're very excited to launch it here. And it is a project that's been in the works for a year. There is a festival version, a gallery version that you can only see here. And then there's a, uh, the Android version, which is a long-form AR content game that takes place over three weeks. Um, essentially, you feed a virtual pet fish your emotions, and he evolves. And depending on what you feed him, he goes through different life stages. Um, so one of the things that we, the reason we did this project is it has to do a lot with me wanting to engage with AR in terms of what does it really mean to have a social reaction, to pe interaction with people if you can see layers on the world that tell you what their emotions are. What is the true objective and subjective experience? Can you ever really know? Can like companies that are, um, there's a few startups out there who are kind of looking at, you know, these, where these worlds for marketing. Can you ever really know um, what they, hello Guppy, how, how are you? Oh, there you are. Uh, yeah, so in terms of 
the concept, because it's important to mention that this is a speculative design project, so no data is ever saved. And that's something as artists we're always debating if we're going to put data in there, uh, say that or not up front. Um, but I will get him in a second. So Guppy is a neural network. Um, I did a lot of research into how they were using uh, training neural networks to recognize images, to recognize content of images. We're also using image recognition and um, emotions within this project as well. Um, so we are using neural networks, but it's not that you're training it here. This is a, a conceptual gesture. Um, and the important, yeah. So the important thing to know is that, I'm gonna give him a little, by like engaging with him, I am sending my face to the, to the cloud, which is just a server of fish tanks and fish that move left, uh, down, up and right to try to like understand human emotion um, and give you that data that I read out. So then it's gonna give me spit out this um, both generative and custom text uh, that is a, a fortune. We actually have the back end of this. We hired and created our own um, library for all the text in this project that uh, Guppy learns language over time, over the weeks you engage with him. Um, there's about like a David Foster Wallace novel of texts that are written by eight uh, interactive writers over five months, and we hired someone to create an open source library for creating generative narrative that we used in this project and is now available called Dialogic um, by Daniel Howe. And the thing that we wanted to explore is, yes, here you go. Sorry, this, uh, the wire is a little bit funny. Um, so I can feed him my tears, and as he eats these emotions, it actually triggers into this like deep um, network of texts, and will be able to like pull up the correct mood and emotions for what he's feeling. The project itself talks a lot about like what is you know data, how, how what is an algorithm, how these um, beings work, and you can kind of play through it, and it will give you some context in the app itself. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, there's a lot of content to go through in so much time. Uh, I did want to do a live performance of the five minute version, but I think we're out of time. So you can play it, however, in the gallery space. Thank you.